Jewish texts are not simple. They operate typically on uh, many levels at one time. Um, Shir or Shira in Hebrew means poetry. It does not mean music. Indeed, Mizmor means music. So Mizmor Shir means musical poetry. Uh, poetic texts have a lot of functions. In our case, whatever else their function is, there's also a commitment to basic Jewish ideology, basic Jewish, basic Jewish philosophy. So together with praise and petition and thanksgiving and repentance and all the other human emotions and performances you can do with a, with a literary text, if you read them carefully, you can see elements of the worldview of the Torah. And given a particular person who's the spokesman, his particular portion of that worldview that he expresses. Now, I don't, we'll see how much time we have tonight, but I want to start on page 633, which is a selection of Psalms, but I'm going to just take one of them from here. Psalm 133, I'm sorry, 113, to the first psalm on the, on the page. And then we'll take a look at the psalm that we're saying now, because it's El, we'll say through most of Tishrei, uh, Psalm 27, and then we'll see how far we can get. Now, this, this psalm has nine verses, and they split up evenly into three groups of three. The first trio is... Give praise, you servants of Hashem. Praise the name of Hashem. Blessed be the name of Hashem from this time forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, Hashem's name is praised. The first three are about praising Hashem, the conditions, when, where, and who. Second trio, high above all nations is Hashem, above the heavens is His glory. Who is like Hashem our God, who is enthroned on high, Yet, now, the literal Hebrew is, lowers himself to look upon the heaven and the earth. Notice, he lowers himself to look upon the heaven. If you thought heaven is where God lives, you belong in Norway with the ancient Norse gods, you know, who lived, you know, in the clouds. That's not a Jewish view. The whole of the created universe is infinitely beneath God. And to interact with it, he has to lower himself, including the heavens. So the second trio of verses describe, describe God as high, above, and transcendent. The third trio, he raises the needy from the dust, from the trash heaps he lifts the destitute. That means he helps the poor. To seat them with, now the translation here isn't wrong, but the literal word here is philanthropists. He seats the poor with philanthropists. And of course, that opposition is not exactly obvious. If you're going to rescue a person from poverty, you place them with the rich or with the comfortable. The connection between poverty and philanthropy is not exactly obvious. But that's what it says. With the philanthropists of his people, he transforms the barren wife into a glad mother of children. So this last trio paints God as helping people in need. And of course, one immediately wants to know why are the poor and the barren chosen as the representatives of people in need? So let's start from the first trio. I'm not exhausting them. I'm taking little elements that I can explain and which I think are particularly significant for questions of a philosophical viewpoint, but uh, I'm not at all exhausting the text. Give praise, you servants of Hashem. Praise the name of Hashem. Is that a limitation? Should only the servants of Hashem praise Hashem? Servants of Hashem mean everybody indiscriminately? Probably not. If it's a subgroup, does that mean other people shouldn't? Why would there be any privileges in praising Hashem? Here lies a key idea which in the modern world is quite controversial. 
my only, my only uh, remark about it is I'm going to tell you the truth. That means the other people who disagree are just getting it wrong. <laughs> Take a look at page 65, which is another psalm of King David. I'm going to tell you now, I heard from Rabbi Donnie Deutsch of Chicago a million years ago. And I've been saying it over in his name for at least a million years. Psalm of Thanksgiving. In the middle of the psalm, Psalm 100, you read, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Now, I don't know how they write this. His courtyards, a chatzer is a courtyard. A court is a place where judges sit and you try cases. In Hebrew, a chatzer is not a place where you go to try cases. A chatzer is a courtyard. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courtyards with praise. So, Rabbi Dani Deutsch said, the gateway is the entranceway to the courtyard. So what is associated with the gate is less significant, it's external, it's superficial. What's associated with the courtyard is internal, central. What's associated with the gate is thanksgiving. What's associated with the courtyard is praise. That verse stimulates the reader to think, what is thanksgiving, what is praise, and how are they related? Thanksgiving has an essentially subjective element. I didn't say it's subjective in character. It's a subjective element. It's a subjective root. The starting point of thanksgiving is, I got something good. I got something good. Something benefited me, pushed me up. That's totally subjective. That's what happened to me. Then Thanksgiving moves outward. Okay, where did it come from? How did it happen? The first realization is that I got something good, and the second is it came from somewhere. I should acknowledge the source. So the psychological and philosophical movement in Thanksgiving is from internal subjective to the objective. Seeking out the source and expressing my gratitude. Praise is wholly objective. Praise is wholly objective. So that Thanksgiving becomes a preparation for praise. This is the point at which many people indoctrinated, I mean educated with, with uh, modern ideas, will say, praise is objective? What are you talking about? You think Shakespeare is great, and I think comic books are great. You think Beethoven's great, and I think the Beatles are great. Praise is just what you think. It's your feeling. It's your opinion. It's totally subjective. There aren't any objective standards as to what's better than what. That's what current indoctr I mean, education um, leads people to think. But it ain't so. John Stuart Mill demonstrated this 100, more than 100 years ago. And to their everlasting credit, and I don't give credit to the New York Times often, and their culture pages, about 10 years ago, they published Mill's argument to their great credit. And here's how it goes. Imagine, there's the first case, imagine that uh, you come across someone, an Australian Aborigine, who has never heard of basketball. He's never heard of it, doesn't know what it is. You say to him, wow, you know what basketball is? Next time you're in Sydney, ring me up. I got something to show you that's really worthwhile. Fine. He comes to Sydney, brings you up. Basketball game's coming on. You want to invite him, get the tickets, you can invite him, come in. <clears throat> and the players are warming up. At one point, he grabs your arm. He says, wow, that's unbelievable. What a great shot. That guy, that guy jumped into the air, and while he was in the air, he threw the ball into that little hoop. What an amazing shot. What a great shot. From the foul line. So you say to him, listen, calm down. <laughs> High school kids can do that. You know, that's, 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 a, that's not a great shot. Maybe during the course of the game, you'll see one or two great shots. What you saw was common. So it isn't great. That means when he said it was a great shot, he was 
wrong. Capital W was a mistake. If praise is totally subjective, there can't be mistakes. There can't be right or wrong. It's just a matter of how you feel. He was overwhelmed and impressed, so for him, he could say what he likes, but that's not true. It is not, in fact, a great shot. That already shows you that praise is not simply an expression of your feelings or your emotions or totally subjective. Now, John Stuart Mill pushed this much further. He said, take two artistic works of any category, both of the same category, Imagine that everyone who can understand both of them prefers one. That might not happen. For a particular pair, some might prefer this, and some might prefer that. But imagine a case where everybody who can understand both prefers one. I'll tell you one which I believe is correct. Everyone who can read um, uh, Mark Twain and Shakespeare and understand both will prefer Shakespeare. Or anyone who could understand both Beethoven and the Beatles will prefer Beethoven. Said uh, John Stuart Mill, if that's the case, then the one that's preferred by everyone who can understand both is objectively greater. After all, someone who prefers the other one is only because he doesn't understand. He hasn't got a choice. He's incompetent to make a judgment. Anyone who's making a judgment will be demand a certain level of competence, a certain level of understanding. If you don't have the understanding, your judgment is worthless. If everyone who has the adequate understanding prefers one, that means that that one is objectively superior. And this has consequences. I used to use this as an example. Maybe it's out of date. I imagined a 15-year-old in Dubai watching a video of the Alps, of skiing in the Alps. And I imagined, at that time anyway, that he had no clue what this is. Today, I think they have artificial snow in Dubai, artificial Alps in Dubai. You know, they've, they've re reproduced everything. But, um, you know, blazing 98 degree heat, but they've had snow anyway. That, that doesn't stop them. But imagine he looks at this and he sees people, it's freezing cold, and uh, something is sliding, and it looks obviously dangerous. And he thinks to himself, oh, this is what they do with political prisoners. You know, they subject them to this kind of torture. You know? But then he notices they're smiling. He reads advertisements. They pay good money to do this. And then he thinks, look, I don't get it. It seems crazy to me. But there are people, and I'm a person. We both have two arms, two legs, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, brain. And if they're enjoying it, then maybe I too could enjoy it. Because we're not so different. So even though it looks weird and difficult and strange and dangerous to me, the fact that other people are enjoying it means that if I, and I have plenty of money in Dubai, you know, I can go for a month. Maybe I should invest in it because maybe I too will get something out of it. In exactly the same sense, a person whose reading skills in English are mediocre picks up Shakespeare and says, oh, God, I can't even understand one page. I'm going back to, to Mark Twain, you know. He prefers Twain to Shakespeare. Now, he does a survey of people. Everyone who can understand both Shakespeare and Twain prefers Shakespeare. He says exactly the same thing to himself that the boy in Dubai did. If all these people, we all read, we all think, we're all, uh, you know, we live in a world, we know that uh, there are eight planets instead of nine, I mean, we're, we're up to date. I just don't get Shakespeare. But if I invent, invested in getting Shakespeare, then I'd have something worthwhile because all the people who can understand both Shakespeare and Twain prefer Shakespeare. That means it's overwhelmingly likely that if I will come to understand Shakespeare, I will feel that I've improved my life by getting something valuable that I didn't have before. <coughs> Judgments of greatness in the arts are objective, not subjective, at least in these cases. Now, we're talking here about praising God. Praising God is no different from praising anything else. Only those who are well enough educated, well enough uh, experienced, sensitive enough to have enough understanding are qualified to praise God. The rest of us quote their praises because we say they are qualified, and this is what they saw fit to say, then this is an appropriate praise. 
In a certain sense, all human beings do this because the famous line that we say over and over again, holy, holy, holy is Hashem, the whole earth is full of His glory, Kaddosh, Kaddosh, Kaddosh. Every time we say that, we are quoting angels. And we say that we're quoting angels. Why do we say that? Because on our own, we wouldn't have thought of this. On our own, we wouldn't be able to judge that it's an appropriate thing to say. But they said it. If they said it, then it's worth saying. So when King David says that praise belongs to those who are servants of Hashem, one thing he means is that the praise is coming from those who are qualified to give praise. And that's a very important philosophical idea. Are we together? Back to 633. I want to look at the last three verses. This is God caring for the needy. The middle three paint God as above, high, beyond, and that's what he does. From that position of great height, transcendent, in, transcendent infinity, what is he doing from there? He's caring for people who are needy. I have to understand what that means, what that communicates. We said there are two categories here, poverty and barrenness. There's a key statement in the Talmud, which gives the background to King David's statement. The Talmud said there are four categories of people who aren't fully alive. Nechshab and Kames, it says in Hebrew, but that's what it means. Aren't fully alive. What are the four categories? The poor, the blind, the childless, and the Matsora. Matsora is a person who has a certain skin condition. It's mistranslated as leprosy. It's not leprosy. We don't know of any physical disease that has these characteristics. But it's has consequences that the person is expelled from the community. So you have the poor, the blind, the childless, and this person who's expelled from the community. What's the idea? Well, the idea is that the purpose of all creation, and in particular the purpose for human beings, is the expression of loving kindness, giving to others, giving to others. A person can be crippled in his ability to give to others in two different ways. One is he might not have the resources to give, and the other he might, is he might not be connected to recipients. Those are the two ways in which a person can be crippled. I don't say he's totally barred, he has no expression, but he's crippled in his ability to give to others. Of the ones who don't have resources, there are two, two examples that the Talmud gives. One is a person who's poor. A poor person can help other people. He can give them advice. He can offer to give them physical aid. But money is a tremendous instrument of being able to help others. And if he's impoverished, he lacks that central instrument of helping others. Blind person also can help other people, but a blind person can't give you a ride in his car. A blind person can't help you redecorate your living room. A blind person needs help in doing a tremendous amount of ordinary activities. In that respect, his ability to help others is greatly reduced. The poor and the blind are people who have a severe lack of abilities, resources to help others. A childless person lacks recipients. I'm going to make a prediction about all of you. When you get married, when you have children, you will discover resources of kindness, giving in you that you didn't know existed. When your child wakes up at 2 a.m. with some kind of pain, and there's nothing you can do directly to relieve the pain, but the child's in pain, you pick up the child, and hold him on your shoulder, and walk up and down, sing to the child, do anything to try to relieve the child's distress, and I'm speaking from experience, you'll be able to walk up and down with that child on your shoulder for two hours. You won't be tired. You won't be irritated. You won't be thinking, boy, am I going to be dead tomorrow? I won't be able to do X, Y, Z, because I won't have had my night's sleep. All you'll be thinking about is, my child is crying. My child is in pain. My child's in distress. You don't know 
that you have that kind of capacity to identify with another and to give to another. Having children brings that out in a person. The childless lack that connection to a recipient which brings out that loving kindness in them. Similarly, the Matsura, he's expelled from the city. He can't have any contact with anybody outside the city. Somebody approaches, he's got to warn him to stay away. He's cut off from people whom otherwise he could help. So, the Talmud has two categories of people without resources or lacking resources, two categories of people who are disconnected from the from recipients. King David chooses one of each. He chooses the poor among those who lack resources, probably because poverty is more common than blindness. He chooses the childless among the, those who don't, are not connected to recipients, probably because childlessness is much more common than Saraz. King David is highlighting these two categories of people and saying that God helps them. God helps them. Okay, let's see if you can put two and two together and get four. Given what I've told you, do you now understand why King David opposes poverty to philanthropy rather than poverty to riches or poverty to being comfortable? Because what is the what is the loss? What is the tragedy in poverty? What's wrong with poverty? You can't give. The spiritual crippling element of poverty is that you can't give. So, King David says, the poor person who in spiritual terms lacks the ability to give, God picks him up and sits, seats him with a philanthropist who can give. In spiritual terms, the poverty, opposite of poverty is philanthropy. And the same with a barren woman. He makes her a glad mother of children. Okay, so now, given what I've told you, what is God giving to each of them? Love and kindness. Say again? Love and kindness. Okay, he's giving them, yes, and in the terms that I, in the quotation from the Talmud, he's giving them life. Because those four categories aren't fully alive. Because the purpose of life is the ability to practice loving kindness. So he's giving them life. Now, one further step. What is God doing in creating the universe? Only one thing, loving kindness. He doesn't get anything out of it other than the ability to express his loving kindness. The verse in King David's psalm says, Olam chesed yibonim. The world is built out of loving kindness. So, by enabling these categories of people to practice loving kindness, he's enabling them to become like him. He's enabling them to become like him. And that's why loving kindness is the purpose of all creation for human beings, because it enables us to become like him. And that is the goal of the whole creation, that human beings should be able to become like him. What I'm telling you now is chapter 2 of The Way of God by Luzzato. I left out one feature, but that's the basic chapter. And that's what's coded into these verses. I don't think I pressed much in. I think that it's pretty clearly indicated in these verses, this whole worldview. Are we together? Okay. Now let's take a look at Psalm 27 on page 171. Since we're saying this now twice a day, nice to see a few things here. Let's read the first few lines, and then we'll try to pick something up from the beginning. Hashem is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Hashem is my life strength. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers approach me to devour my flesh, my tormentors and my foes against me. It is they who stumble and fall. Though an army should besiege me, my heart would not fear. Through the war would arise against me. In this I trust. In this I trust. One thing I asked of Hashem that I shall seek, that I dwell in the house of Hashem all the days of my life, to behold the sweetness of Hashem and to contemplate in His sanctuary. Period. Okay, right in the middle you have the phrase, in this I trust. What does the word this refer to? 
Does it refer to the text before the word this? Or does it refer to the text after the word this? Okay, the natural thing to say is what he say. The text before talks about how God saves, how God protects. It talks about the fact that I'm not afraid. And then King David ends that passage with, and in this I trust. I trust the fact that God has saved me and provided for me, defended me consistently. I think, and the, some commentators do say that. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Could the word this refer to what comes after it? If it does, what would it mean? We're talking now about trusting, the, being confident, being, uh, feeling protected, feeling that I'm not going to suffer loss or attack because I trust in something. The first thought was, I trust in the fact that he protected me in the past, so I trust he'll protect me in the future. The second thought is, I'm trusting, I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to be victimized, I'm not going to be attacked, I'm not going to be hurt, because I trust in the fact that I ask for something. I'm trusting in the fact that that's what I'm asking for. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm dreaming about. That's what my basic values are. The fact that that's what I want is a reason for me to trust that God will protect me. Mm. The contrast between the two ways, of, and, and the commentators are split, which means both, both explanations are appropriate. One is that he has done for me in the past, he will do for me in the future. The second is, not that he's done for me in the past, and not that I have a good record, not that I have a good record, not that I deserve it, he will protect me because of what I want, what I'm hoping for, what I'm trying to achieve. It means his protecting me is not a reward for past performance. His protecting me is an investment in my future because of what I want. I think this gives us a very profound picture. If I'm asking Hashem for help, if I'm asking Hashem for forgiveness, asking for Hashem for, for protection, I don't have to say, look at all the things I did right, look at all the courage and dedication I displayed and I deserve it because it might not be true. I might not have done so well. I might not deserve it in those terms. But that's not my only resource. I can say to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, I failed, I stumbled, I tripped, I have made mistakes, but look what I want. Look what I'm hoping for. Look what I'm dedicated to. And I'm asking you to invest in that. That's the other explanation of Bezos and Ibotea. What I'm trusting is the fact that this is what I want. And that's what gives me the, the, the ability to trust. Yeah. In other words, you're asking Kodesh Baruch to activate his midot of midot of Rachamim and Oizer uh -huh. and towards us. Yes. It's activation of that. It's, 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 it's you know, Kodesh Baruch's characteristics of us. It's expressing towards us, irrespective of the past. Well, mm -hmm. irrespective of my performance, mm -hmm. But not irrespective of my character. Yeah. My character is worth investing in, even though my performance may not have matched it's a very, very important distinction. It's a very I think so. Distinction. It's a I very, think so. I very think deep, so. Very profound. It's, a, it's a beautiful distinction. I think so. Because on the contrary, if, 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 you, if you invest in your character, then it means the Kodesh Baruch could be on you and could be on yourself because the Kodesh Baruch could be on you. Okay. Okay. You could say that. You could say that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now. Let's go a little bit further here. I'm going to say this in the Hebrew. The, the English sort of the English here is good, and, and it gives it away. But I will. Uh, so I'll, if, if you can follow the Hebrew at all, eight lines down, three words. The third word from the end of the line. Here, the trans. I'm going to give a little translation. A little translation is very, very difficult, very puzzling. Lacha, to you, Omar Libi. My heart said, Bakshu fonai, seek out my face, but Bakshu is plural. Bakshu is plural. All of you should seek out my face. To you, singular, my heart said, Bakshu, all of you, seek out my face. As panecha Hashem abakesh. Hashem, your face shall I seek. Read literally, it makes absolutely no sense. The lucho is singular, and Bakshu is plural. Who's talking to who? Rashi explains as follows. 
the literal usage, based on the way the lacha is used in other places. Lacha can mean for your ser- for your sake, in your place, as your agent, as your representative. So, the person is speaking to God, and the person is saying to God, "My heart gave me, gave me a message. My heart spoke on your behalf." My heart, so to speak, is quoting you, God, quoting your message. What is God's message? Bakshu fanai. Seek out my face. God has a message for us, and he implants that message in each person's heart. And the message is, Bakshu fanai. Seek out my face. The message is plural. The message that's implanted in my heart isn't just for me. The message that's implanted in my heart is a social message that there is a, 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 um, an invitation from God that we collectively should seek out his face. And then King David says, I'm responding to that message. as Hashem Yes, Hashem, your face shall I seek out. Now this, I think, carries another very profound message. My heart is carrying God's message. What is the attitude of the Torah generally towards reliability of the human heart? It's not very favorable. In the Shema, the third paragraph of the Shema, we say twice a day, Losasuru, achrei Losasuru, literally, says the Malbim, means don't evaluate. Don't evaluate through your heart and your eyes. Your heart and your eyes have inherent prejudices, subjectivities, distortions. Don't use them as the means of your evaluation. King David seems to be painting a different picture. Heart is carrying Hashem's message. That definitely means you should pay attention to it. I think maybe that's why we say this psalm in El and in Tishrei through Sukkot. Because there is a time during the year where the circumstances straighten us out. The circumstances uh, greatly improve our vision, our perception, our understanding. Elul, anticipating the coming of Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, blowing the shofar every morning, if you're lucky enough to be a Sephardi, you're already saying Slichos for the whole month. If you're a poor, backwards Ashkenazi, you get about a week of it. Um, at this time, the heart is injected with an element of objectivity, and it brings this precious message from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he wants us to seek him out. And then... Our job is to respond to that message. <clears throat> Are we together so far? Yeah. Question is, why would a Kodesh Baruch Hu take something that's subject to prejudice, as you mentioned, in the heart, and that very same organ, spiritually and physically speaking, on all levels, is the very organ he asks you to use entirely to serve him with? In the Shema, the beginning, the one that's susceptible to it, he's asking you to please use that. Oh, that's not a problem. The fact that something is fragile and capable of distortion doesn't mean I should simply discard it. Everything that's created is created as a means to be able to, uh, to, uh, to accomplish something positive with it. In science, you have many, many instruments that are very fragile. Mm. And the slightest, when you're doing quantum mechanical experiments, the slightest disturbance will destroy, will give you decoherence and will destroy the quantum state that you're trying to account. That doesn't mean you say, well, let's go back to chemistry, you know, let's go back to build, build, making cement. Well, what what you do is you, you have to ex- exercise extreme care mm-hmm. to be able to use it in the appropriate fashion. But, I mean, what I'm saying is the support of David Amelech, because it's so, the heart is so special to Hashem. Yes. And it's to use it to call Hashem Shemayim. Okay. But doing so, you've got to, with David Amelech, that's all said, Shaviti Hashem Nedi Tamid. If it's a focus on that, it'll avoid the distortions. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. I don't see what, I don't hear a problem here. 
The heart is difficult, the heart is fickle, and, and some of these distortions. You have to struggle to be able to use it appropriately. The Torah tell, warns you that to allow the heart on its own to be your standard of evaluation is inappropriate. King David is saying sometimes the message that the heart itself delivers is an accurate message. Sometimes. And I say that the reason we say this psalm is in the Elohim and Tishrei is because that's the prime time that the message of the heart will be reliable. Now, this idea of God saying to us, Bakshufanai, seek out my face, is also directly relevant to this period of time. There's a verse in Isaiah. Verse in Isaiah says, Dish Rashabi Matso Krauhubi also Karov. Seek out Hashem when he's found, call to him when he's near. So Isaiah is telling us sometimes he's found in near and some other times he isn't. <clears throat> That's a special time. When is that time? Says the Talmud. From Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, the ten days. That's when he's found. That's when he's near. That's the time to seek him out and to call out to him. Of course, you can pray to God all year long. But during those ten days, something special is happening. The Talmud says, this is what's happening. A person performs a transgression, and he should do tshuva to repair it. It's February. He does tshuva in March. Calls out to God, asks for forgiveness, reforms and repairs his ways. God might not respond immediately. He might not respond immediately. There's no guarantee. But from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, you call out to God, you do tshuva, you ask for forgiveness, God responds instantaneously. That's what's special. That's what Isaiah is indicating is special about Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, that the response is instantaneous. Why is the response instantaneous? So the Svarim explained as follows. When a person performs a transgression, he is retreating from God. God mirrors the human being's action by retreating from the human being. The result is a double distance that's set up. If you imagine them connected at the beginning, the human being retreats and God also retreats. In February, when the human being performs a transgression, there's a double retreat. In March, the human being goes back to where he was. Tshuva, literally in Hebrew, means return. He goes back to where he was, and although there are footnotes and modification, but that's a basic meaning, God might or might not close the distance from his side right away. There's no guarantee. But from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur, God moves first. He moves first. Before you do tshuva and before you call out, he's already closed the distance from his side. So then, at that time, when a human being does tshuva and asks for forgiveness, the response is, in, is immediate because God's already there. He came first and is waiting for you. That's what Bakshufanai means. God says, seek out my face because I'm already there waiting for you. That's what makes the days of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur so precious. And we say this psalm in Elul, preparing for Rosh Hashanah, and we say it throughout Rosh Hashanah through Kippur, and through Sukkot for, for a certain extended reason, but the focus is the ten days of Rosh Hashanah through Kippur. Indeed, we blow shofar the first day of Rosh Hashanah, depending upon whether it's Shabbos or not, second day, second day is rabbinic. It's the first day, which is the biblical commandment. Tell me, what is the very last thing we do on Yom Kippur? Blow the shofar. One shofar blast at the very end of Yom Kippur. What's that? What's that? Is there a mitzvah blowing a shofar on Yom Kippur? Only in the Yovel, the Jubilee year, when the Yovel is practiced. And it isn't one blast. So that's not what's going on. Now, the key to this performance is found in a sitter as a, an explanation, a two-word explanation, the shofar blast at the end of Yom Kippur, and the words are siluk shechina, God's presence leaves. The function of the, of the shofar Rosh Hashanah is to announce God's presence among the Jewish people. 
That's, so to speak, when he arrives. We said the verse in Isaiah says, Seek out Hashem when he's present. The Talmud says he's present from Yashan to Yom Kippur. The shofar, like a king who's traveling from town to town, will send his trumpeters ahead of him, and they will blow a flourish in the town square to announce to the town that the king is arriving. That's the idea of the shofar of Rosh Hashanah. And when the king exits the town, as he exits the town, the trumpeters blow a final flourish on the trumpets, signified that the king has exited. That's the shofar at the end of Yom Kippur. The shofar at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, at the end of Yom Kippur, are like parentheses around the ten days. The ten days are the time of the year when God and the Jewish people are closest. No other time of the year can match that. Not the Seder, it's not the first night of Pesach, which is so glorious and inspiring and thrilling with the, all the family and friends and the wonderful mitzvahs that are done. Not Shavuos when you stay up all night learning Torah. Not Sukkot, the end of Sukkot when you dance with the Torah, Simchas Torah. They're all wonderful, glorious, ecstatic, inspiring. But the connection that you have during the 10 days can't be matched. That's the Bak Shufanai. Because Baruch says, I'm there. I came first. I want to be with you. Seek out my face. Because if you do, there'll be an instant connection. And there's another element here, which I think is, is also important and, and also in a way sur surprising. Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. So is Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah, if we do tshuva, I need footnotes there, but I'm skipping it. Rosh Hashanah, if you do tshuva, what can you hope for? The only thing you can hope for Rosh Hashanah if you do tshuva is mercy. Cleansing, wiping away the transgressions of the past only happens on Yom Kippur. Cleansing only happens on Yom Kippur. So Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment. If you behave appropriately, you can get mercy. Yom Kippur, you can get, you can get cleansing. Why not have Yom Kippur first? Why not have Yom Kippur first? Have Yom Kippur first, be cleansed, then commit to Rosh Hashanah clean. Then you'll get a good judgment. You won't have to ask for mercy. You'll be worthy of a good judgment. Why do it this way? So the bitter, depressing answer is, if Yom Kippur came first, you wouldn't take it seriously. You wouldn't take it seriously. You need time to work up to it. You need time to be prepared for it. Take it seriously. So good Rosh Hashanah first. But there's another way to look at it. And that is, think of the vote of confidence that God is giving in the Jewish people. He says, oh, I forgot to, I forgot to mention, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the theme of Rosh Hashanah in all the prayers is recognizing God's being king of the universe. Um, if you take a look, the prayers change. Rosh Hashanah, three of Kippur. And certain additions are made and certain changes are made. If you take a look on page um, 101, you see that during the rest of the year, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's 103. During the rest of the year, the third blessing ends with the Holy God. And in the gray, it tells you to replace it with the Holy King. We stress the fact that God is king. On Rosh Hashanah, we crown king, God, king of the universe. Now. Isn't God higher than king? So. Good. That's true. He is, I got a number of different characteristics. And king is a particularly uh, odd characteristic. Let's find him talk about this. Because there's a, a phrase that you find in the there's no king without a nation. King can't be a king without a nation. Now that's stated that way, pardon my brutal language, but that's colossally stupid. Yeah, and you can't have uh, you can't have a pencil without length. I mean, of course you can't have a king without a, a solitary person can't be a king. That's not what the Chazal mean. What they mean, according to Rehnebuchai and others, is that 
The king is only a king if the people make him king. The people have to accept him as king. Otherwise, he isn't king. He can be a ruler in Hebrew, Moshel. He can be a dictator, Adon, or Dabar in, in, in biblical Hebrew, but he can't be a Melech. We accepted him in Matan Torah. We accepted him in Matan Torah, exactly. That's why Nasef and Ishma came first, because if it had just been under force, that, that wouldn't have made him king. That's why when we say the Shema, we talk about God being king, we talk, call it Kabbalas, all Malchus Shemaim, accepting the yoke of the kingdom of heaven upon ourselves. We don't call it Hakaras Malchus Shemaim, recognizing God's kingdom. We don't call it that, because that wouldn't do it. You can't recognize that he isn't king unless we make him king. Now that, Ramchal says, is almost blasphemy. There's a central characteristic that God has that depends upon us. We confer upon God that characteristic? That's astonishing. That's, I think, part of what you mean when you say this low. Master, he's master whether we like it or not, whether we recognize it or not. He just is. Ruler, he's ruler whether we like it or not. He just is. Infinite and all-knowing and all the rest. King is, a, is something that we confer upon him. And Rav Moshe Shapiro Shlita, one of the world's greatest experts in Jewish philosophy today, about 34 years ago, he gave Shi'urim in Or Sameach to the students at that time, very early time, and he's in Israeli, he speaks in Hebrew. About four years ago, his students put out a sefer with the material in those lectures on the 13th principle of faith. Fascinating sefer. And one of the things he says there is, our um, certainty of our existence, our guarantee that we exist is because God chose for himself the quality of king. Since he can only be king if we make him king, and he chose that quality of himself of being king, that's what guarantees that we will always exist. Because without us, he can't be king. So if he's chosen to be king, that gives us our, our guarantee of existence. A fascinating insight. At any rate, now, Rosh Hashanah comes before Yom Kippur, so we haven't been cleansed yet. So we're still, fashmutzed, as we say in Yiddish, we're still covered with the dirt of our transgressions and failures. And God says, I want you to make me king. I want you, with your dirty and torn clothes, with your poor record, with your failures, before they're forgiven and wiped away, I want you to make me king. Could you imagine a greater vote of confidence than that? Look how much God believes in our potential. It's mind -blowing. It is mind-blowing. It's a mind-blowing idea. And I'll finish with a, a parable that I heard from my son, my oldest son. I always quote because he knows these things better than I do. Based on a verse in Ezra, Nehemia. He says, because it says over there, I, the, Ezra and Nehemia say to the people who are crying, it's Rosh Hashanah, they're crying and they're worried. They say, don't cry, don't worry, go home, be happy. Ki chedvas Hashem hi ma'uzchem. You're rejoicing in God as your strength. So he, he gave the following parable. Imagine a king who travels around his kingdom periodically, and he comes with his FBI. He comes with the FBI. One of the things the king does is he catches criminals whom the local authorities can't catch, and he punishes them. And he's very good at it. He's very good at it. Criminals know to get lost, you know, because they're going to be caught. There's a thief. The thief has been a thief for years. He's escaped. He's uh, avoided the local authorities. And now, as an announcement, the king's coming to town. The thief says, well, I better get out of here. I'm going to be caught. I'm going to be punished. The thief says, but the king is coming to town. How can I not be there to greet him? How can I do that? I can't do that. I can't not be there. So the king comes into town with his soldiers, with his FBI, and the thief is there with the cheering crowds, cheering and waving the flag and celebrating. And they catch him. Of course they catch him. The FBI doesn't miss. They bring him before the king and say, we caught him, he's a thief, here's his criminal record, and so on and so on. And the king says to the thief, are you crazy? You know that I was here. 
You know that I have a perfect FBI. You knew you were going to be caught. Be caught. Why didn't you run? And the thief says, Your Majesty, you're right. I thought I should run. I wanted to run, but I couldn't not be here when you came. I couldn't not join in the celebration of your coming here. Will not the king count that in his good favor? That he's so thrilled with the fact that the king is coming that he couldn't even save himself, couldn't even protect himself. Ki chedvas Hashem hi ma'uzchem. Your joy in God is your strength. It'll be your defense. That's the idea of Hashem coming, and that's the Shem who says, Bakshu Panai. Seek out my face. I came first. I came first because I care about you. Because I want you to be rehabilitated. Because I believe in you. I came first. If you come back to me, the connection will be instantaneous.